Hello and welcome to another edition of our Memory Lane podcast here on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. And I am very pleased to be joined now by a man who has not only one of the greatest stories in Pittsburgh sports history, but really one of the greatest stories in in all of sports history. He is Rocky Blyer, Steelers legend, four-time Super Bowl winner. Rocky, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Hey, you're welcome, Corey. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Rocky, what we're going to do in this, we're going to talk about Rocky's war and military service, the things he went through, then his football career with the Steelers, and then his uh, life since his football career ended. But I want to just start, Rocky, with if you could let the folks know what you're doing now, people who maybe have not heard from you in a while, what are you up to these days? <laughs> well, actually, actually, I run a construction company, Rocky Blair Construction Group. We're a commercial contractor. We do federal government work specifically uh, within our VA system uh, around uh, Vision 4. Uh, and into Vision 5 from Erie all the way down to Clarksburg, West Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we've been doing that for the last 20 years or so, and so that has been, uh, uh, been a big part of my life. How much of a part of your life, Rocky, is people wanting to talk to you about your experiences in both Vietnam and with the Steelers? Well, I think there's a couple of things that had, that had happened, especially in my life, or being in, in 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 the position that I was with. So, and let's go back and talk about. Um, if, 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 let's go back to the latter part of the '60s and in my experience. And so, we got to talk about the Vietnam War that was taking place, uh, et cetera, uh, and more importantly about the uh, the soldier who fought in that war. Unfortunately, at that period of time, the soldier was identified with the conflict. So that Vietnam veteran um, was looked down upon. Um, he was spat upon. And there was, uh, uh, he he uh, was not accepted into society as a soldier. Uh, he was asked by the military, you know, to uh, change your uniform uh, when you're getting off the plane so that you're not harassed by uh, you know, civilians, et cetera. Uh, and so he had to repress his feelings and go about his life as he best possibly can, meaning went back to school, raised a family and so on, um, was not accepted within society, uh, didn't, was not uh, entertained with open arms by either the, v, uh, by the VFW or the American Legion, you know, where he could get together. And so he's, he, he's just been kind of alone out there. Um, I've run into family members who said, yeah, dad has never talked about his experience, uh, has never talked about uh, what he did or where he was stationed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's somewhat of a shame. Now, just to put it in perspective, I come back and I become a story only because why? Well, I'm coming back to a high profile industry, so to speak. Here's a kid that's that's trying to make a, a football team um, after uh, after being injured in, in Vietnam. So all of a sudden I became a story. Personally, I then became a, it was somewhat of a catharsis. I got a chance to talk about my experience. I got a chance to talk about uh, uh, what I like, didn't like, uh, comparisons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and to some in small group, I was accepted uh, and then put on somewhat of a pedestal for overcoming these obstacles and so on. Um, and so then, you know, so then the mission was kind of like, I hate to say, kind of like somewhat being a, you know, a poster child for the military or helping, you know, guys. So guys that I, the Vietnam veterans specifically, identified with, well, here's one of ours, at least came back, at least got recognized, at least was able to talk about some of those experiences. And, uh, and so then that kind of was a role that, you know, that ultimately uh, was formed and that I played in those early parts of, of, of being part of the Steeler organization. And thus, with the success of the Steelers uh, and being part of that team and winning four Super Bowls, it just multiplied um, in, in the story and um, uh, in the relationship uh, with the Vietnam veterans. And ultimately, that had changed over that period of time. So that was somewhat, you know, uh, kind of the role that was formulated um, in, in the early part of my career. Rocky, you play your rookie year with the Steelers, 1968. 
and then you're drafted into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So for those who don't know the story, how was it shocking? Was it something? Could you have expected that as an NFL football player in any way? Well, there's a couple of things that had taken place. Now, again, we're going back in time. We're going back in years. We're going back to 19, we're back to the 60s, uh, back to the conflict that was taking place, the unpopularity of that war that was taking place, uh, the institution of the draft um, uh, to, um, uh, to, to eligible uh, people. Uh, after 18, you became eligible for the draft. Then you got a student deferment. Uh, for four years, and then you became eligible again at the age of 22 or after you either left college or dropped out of college or graduated. And then um, so so all that was in the background. All that was taking place, as I had mentioned, was not a, necessarily a, a, you know, a popular work. Now, in the back of my mind, just in the back of my mind, <laughs> Growing up in 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 the Midwest, growing up in a place called Appleton, Wisconsin, being a Green Bay Packer fan as, as a kid during the early part of the '60s, you know, I did notice that you know uh, some of those players were in the reserve or the National Guard, and so kind of in the back of your mind, you go, "Oh, well, I guess maybe that's the process that takes place if you make it into a professional uh, team." They'll find us. They'll take care of you, and you know, and find you a spot, whatever it might be. So that was always in the that that had taken place in, it, 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 in the back of my mind, <clears throat> and then it became a reality. And I, I can remember <laughs> at my time, it doesn't take much, but uh, one of the happiest days in my early training uh, camp uh, experience as my rookie season. It was in August. It was towards the end of training camp. And um, we were playing the exhibition season and uh, Bill Austin was the head coach at the time. And so he uh, pulled me out of a meeting where I was leaving a meeting. He said, can I speak to you for a moment? I said, yes. He said, listen, he said, uh, we got this letter in the mail um, and uh, it was my 1A classification. Uh, and he said, we, we opened it up. Um, anyway, he said, we think you're good enough to make this team and we'll take care of this for you. So whatever taking care of that meant, I thought, well, get in the reserve and National Guard because that was what I thought process. Anyway, it was 1968, the height of the war, you know, <laughs> opportunities to get in the reserve were filled and so on and so on. To make a long story short, um, I then got my, my, my notification to be inducted um, as I slipped through the cracks uh, within a process that had taken place. Um, and so it was somewhat, um, I, you know, in the back of my mind, I knew it was there. I knew it was floating out there, you know, not knowing what was going to take place. Um, and uh, when I got that uh, notification, it was not necessarily up, out of the out of the out of the blue shock, but it was like I had to report the next morning. <laughs> I got this on a Wednesday <laughs> afternoon and it said to report the next morning at 7 a.m. to uh, to be inducted into the armed services. Now, it was post dated or the letter was I was supposed to have a week somehow it got lost in the mail. So by the time I got it, it was the day before. And uh, so all of a sudden, you know, my life was turned upside down. Um, and to some degree, as I look back on it now, after all these years, to some degree, it was somewhat fortunate. I didn't have to sit around and think about it, you know, coming upon me. It just was a reaction. You know, I had to go down. And then I, 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 I so then I was sent off to um, basic training and then so on. And so, you, so you're always in a reactive mode at that time rather than feeling sorry for yourself or whatever it is. And so you just went through that process. And you were deployed directly to Vietnam pretty quickly? Pretty quickly, yeah. So you go through the process and the process, you go through basic training, then you go through advanced um, infantry training. That's another eight weeks. Uh, and then you get your orders to wherever you may go. Obviously, this was 1968, um, height of the war, and my orders was to report um, to uh, San Francisco to be deployed to uh, to Vietnam. And um, so that was it. And so I went out there, got in country in Vietnam in uh, May of 69. 
How long were you in country, Rocky? And again, most people listening to this w- would know your story, but but maybe but many okay. don't. You know, some, you know, so I was in country four and a half months. Uh, I was in country four and a half months uh, before we um, got in a firefight uh, and before I got wounded. Um, and so, um, and that was long enough. <laughs> so I, it was four and a half. So it was about four and a half months. So it was August. Of, uh, I got in there in May. So it was August 20th of, of, uh, of that same year um, when, uh, when I got wounded. Can you share what you remember about August 20th? Yes, uh, very much so. So what had taken place was that just to, 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 to put it in perspective, there is that we operated, we as American soldiers operated in um, an area of operation. So we had a battalion. A battalion was made up of four companies and we worked out of landing zones. A landing zone was on top of a mountain and that's where uh, the artillery would be, uh, uh, were on top of those mountains to cover the area of operation in which we uh, were operating in. Also, it was a landing zone, uh, bringing in supplies and so on. So a company would have perimeter guard around one of these landing zones. And so the other two companies were in the field doing um, doing their process, going through, we're, you know, checking out whatever it needed to be. And we would rotate. So you'd be on a landing zone, then you'd be down in, in the valley working the ground. Then you'd be up on another landing zone. Then you'd be, and this was kind of the upper. So we uh, were up on LZ Siberia. We worked out of two, LZ West and LZ Siberia. We were up in LZ Siberia when the word came down to be on 24 hour alert. That's all we got as a private in the, uh, in the U.S. Army, uh, no reasons why or whatever it is, enemies in the act in in the in the area. What I found out later later was that there's a uh, NVA regiment that was working its way down into our valley from uh, north of Vietnam, Vietnam, uh, <clears throat> and um, so we were kind of a retaining force. The Marines were north, pushing them down. We were kind of a retaining force, and uh, so now they're into our valley. And um, Bravo Company, I was in Charlie Company. Bravo Company was in the field. As I said, we were up in LZ, Siberia. Charlie, I mean, Bravo Company gets hit. And all of a sudden, we are medevac, not medevac, we are evacuated off the hill, helicopters down into the valley, because we're going to help support. Uh, Bravo Company. And so we finally get there to them late at night. They had pulled um, most of their wounded out, although some remain. Um, we had some uh, bodies that were left behind. And so we were to pull front and rear security to get them out of that uh, hot spot. As we're doing that late at night, we ran into a, a, another quick firefight. The word was to leave the bodies. We'll come back and pick them up in, in the next couple of days. So that was our mission uh, as we were returning, to come back and pick up those bodies that we'd left behind. And it was a reinforced platoon, which meant it was my platoon, plus uh, the command officer, my commanding officer, uh, and the first sergeant um, and the radio guy were with us as well. So we're, we're moving back and um, we come upon the, a, a rice paddy in, in which we had, uh, in which they had fought in before, in which we, we, we had left the bodies and we ran into um, uh, another uh, conflict with uh, soldiers from the um, regiment, from the North Vietnamese regiment. So we had a quick firefight out there. Uh, we dropped back, set up, a, and that's when I got hit the first time um, in a rice paddy. And uh, so we dropped back and we set up another defensive position. They probed our perimeter and a grenade came in and uh, hit our position and went off and blew up through my, my, both my legs and, 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 and my foot. Uh, and we were another firefight until another platoon fought its way down and, 
and dragged us out of there. So that's kind of basically the action that had taken place at, and the reasons why we were there and and what had happened. So we finally got to uh, to a medevac area, um, and uh, from there I, I I flew out to an aid station, quickly got patched up, and then flew to the Nang, uh, where I spent a couple of days in, in the hospital before I went to Tokyo, where I spent three weeks in the hospital before I came back to the States. I spent nine months in the hospital and through three more operations. Anyway, so that was kind of the process that had taken place there. Were you, were you close, Rocky, to not getting out? Um, I mean, getting out of that uh, situation? Alive. Alive, yeah. Well, you know, it's a, <laughs> you never know. I mean, because it's one of those things where you never know. Um, what has taken place. I mean, you're just a soldier within a group of soldiers. Uh, and, you know, and so I didn't know the strength. I didn't know any of this stuff until much later uh, after I got out, find some research and did some what actually took place. Um, but, uh, you know, so anything can happen. There was a couple of firefights that had taken place uh, on the perimeter of uh, of where we were. Um, but, you know, so you never know. So it's just one of those those processes. So by the time um, that we got to the rear security and then helicopters came in and, and, and took us, you know, out of that area. But we moved pretty much through the night, you know, so there wasn't a whole, you know, they didn't know what our location was. The reason that we're trying to get to those, the, the, Bravo company out of that position was because um, it's so easy to, to define which, uh, where your position was so that they could then lob bigger mortars on and or artillery onto that position. You know, so you, you need to keep moving. So they didn't know where you, where you are. And, you know, and it, unlike today, maybe we didn't have the sophistication of, of, of GPS or <laughs> Or you know movement or troop movements and you know seeing bodies and and, and so on so on so uh, the night helped us um, as well as moving helped us uh, to, to get out of there. We're with uh, Rocky Blyer. Just an amazing story. A hit by a grenade in, in Vietnam comes back to the United States. We're going to take a really quick break here, and in our second segment, talk to Rocky about his recuperation. Did he think he would play football again? And then obviously he did and had a tremendous career for the Steelers. So we'll take a real quick break here and be right back in just a second. All right, welcome back to our Memory Lane podcast on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. And Rocky, you talked about you come back to the United States. You're in a hospital, I believe you said, for nine months. What what goes through a young man's mind who had played a season in the NFL? You take a grenade in Vietnam, and you're in a hospital for nine months. What what is Rocky Blyer thinking at that time? You know, part of the you know part of the thing just to understand being in the hospital for nine months was that I wasn't able to go back to active duty because of the injuries that I sustained. So there was a healing process that took place. I was attached to a hospital. You know, I wasn't sitting in a bed for nine months. You know, but I was attached to the hospital uh, and like an outpatient. You know, and I'd come and go see my doctors, and um, uh, and then I. I uh, I, I had a quote a job, um, so to so to speak, where I'd show up in an office and push some paperwork around and <laughs> do some stuff of that nature. But anyway, so 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 the thought was my thought was this, and I you know as simple as it may be, was that obviously the one thing that I wanted to do was to come back and play, and um, although. You know, several doctors said, don't, you, know, you won't be able to do that. Don't worry about it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because of the damage that had taken place. But in my simple, simple mind, you know, I'm thinking, OK, fine. You know, if you if you if you if you think about it as kids growing up, growing up in a neighborhood, playing outside, playing in organized sports, playing in pickup games, uh, playing one on one basketball, just fooling around. We have injuries. You know, you fall down, you scrape your knee, you, you know, you, you stub your toe, 
you might break a finger. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, and, or you pulled a hamstring or whatever it might be. And so there's kind of a learned process is that it hurts. Okay. You go see mom or dad, <laughs> they yell at you and then you go see a doctor and then, uh, it heals. And then you're back out playing again, you know? Right. So it's right. just that right. it's that rotation and you just go back out. So in my simple mind, it was like, okay, fine. You know, I, I didn't lose anything. I didn't lose an arm. I didn't lose a leg. You know, I didn't lose a limb damage, but you know, we've all been hurt at one time or another. So, and you're probably you know. telling the doctor, Hey, I'm going to go back and play football, right? <laughs> well, that's right. You know, and I got enough courage at one time. So this was kind of an interesting thing. I got enough courage. I was in I was in Tokyo at the time, and I and and I and, and so my doctor and I and my my first question was, Doc, what do you think? What do you think about my ability to come back and play football because of the damaged? And he and he goes, oh, You'll have a normal life. You'll be able to do the things that normal people do. Just just don't expect to get back on that playing field because you just won't have the, the strength nor the flexibility to do the things that are necessary to be a running back in the NFL. So what he had formulated from his point of view, from his stream of information, correct or not in his diagnosis, was a perception about my ability. But, and this is the important thing, as an authority figure, he just sucked that hope, kind of that sucked that hope right out. And I tell this story because a couple of days later, I'm denouncing me, I get a postcard in the mail, simple postcard. It's got two lines on it. It's this, rock, team's not doing well. We need you. Art Rooney. Wow. Somebody needs me. Well, they didn't need me. Somebody took the time to care. That's all it is. So, um, and so anyway, so in my mind, I'm going, okay, fine. I need to do some things to be able to get this body in shape. So I had went over to Vietnam. I weighed 100, 200 pounds. By the time I came back, I weighed 165 pounds. So obviously I got to put some weight back on. So I then, you know, and then I got to try to get this body back in shape and so on. So I would get up, I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and I, you know, and I'd start running as best I possibly could. You know, get a half a mile in, get a mile in, get a mile and a half, get, you know, two miles in the morning before I had to go to, uh, to uh, do my assignment uh, and, and, and go to work. Then I would get off in the afternoon, I'd go to the gym. And start lifting again and start lifting again and then repeat that process and repeat the process because that's all I had to do at that period of time. But I wanted to get back at, at least some shape for possibly that coming season. Now, in the military at that time, um, you if <laughs> this was you, you if you were uh, in seasonal employment, basically, if you were like a farmer you know, and you had a plant during the fall season, you could get an early out by the military to be able to, you know, you had a two-year commitment and then all of a sudden, let's just say it was November by like, oh, okay, September, October. Hey, I need to go plant. They could possibly give you an early out. That's was in the back of my mind. Okay. So I thought, well, I'm in the service, so on and so on. And I can, uh, Hopefully, maybe go back and see what ha happens um, with the Steeler organization uh, in October or September, just to let them know. Anyway, a change had taken place uh, within the military because they were starting to downsize. This was 1970. Um, and uh, so now I, I remember one day I, I, I uh, ran into a, a fellow soldier who was in personnel. And uh, so he informed me, he said, hey, they're giving um, uh, five months early outs. I go, why? Well, you are attached to your last unit. So my last unit was active combat duty. Okay. Even though I was in the States, until I got reassigned to somewhere, my last duty was in Vietnam. And he said, you can get a five month early out. I said, how? Oh. Well, if you're on combat active duty, you know, they're, they're trying to downsize this. And I said, oh, when can I get out? Tomorrow. 
Kidding me? No. He said, I said, "What do I have to do? What do I have to do?" <laughs> sign he, up. Yeah, he's gonna go. You, well, you got to get this here. You got to sign this, 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 and you got to get a release from your doctor from the hospital. You know, just to say you're you're eligible to go back to active duty, or we'll release you from the hospital so I can process this five months. Yeah. Anyway, make a long story short. Um, it took me a day <laughs> or an extra day. I should to be able to do it, get the doctor to sign my release and bam, I'm gone. And um, it's in July before training camp goes. And I had been working out, I've got my, you know, I, 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 to some degree and it was in somewhat, uh, I think, you know, pretty good shape. I've been running, you know, as best I possibly could, trying to get myself back in shape. And um, so I called the Steelers and asked if I could come back to training camp. <clears throat> They allowed me to come back uh, in 1970 uh, to training camp. To have, and, to have that, Rocky, yeah. to have, you mentioned the, the Chiefs sending you the postcard. Right. And to have the, the Steelers want you back. You're obviously very dedicated doing all of this work to get yourself back. To have them want you back, how much of a motivating factor was that for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a big it was a big motivating factor, you know, because that was part of, you know, um, how they operated. That was part of the chief, part of Dan Rooney, you know, just their 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 mentality of, of inclusiveness of, you know, here's a here's a kid, you know. So and they let me stay in training camp all through training camp. And um, and and basically I wasn't ready to come back. And basically, it took its toll. Um, it being two a days going through it, you know, um, it was yeah, yeah. some of my wounds broke open, you know, and I, I, I had blood in my socks. And in any way, but uh, by the time two, I'd be limping in the afternoon a little bit. Make a long story short, they let me stay that whole training camp, and. <clears throat> Ultimately, they released me, or they, you know, they, 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 they let me go. And um, I remember, <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember that incident uh, very well. It was uh, it was the last day we were we were we were at Three River Stadium. We just moved into Three River Stadium um, from training camp. I'm still hanging around, and I'm going, oh man, you know, nobody. You know, it's the last day. It's the last cut day. And I'm looking around to see if anybody is like looking at me like, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to cut you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going, oh, OK, fine. And then Ralph Berlin, who was our trainer at the time, who was also had the responsibility of being the Turk, um, because he's the one that would inform you that Chuck Knoll wanted to see you. And the kiss of death was, and bring your playbook. Yeah. And so <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I might have made this when I get a tap on the, my shoulder and it's Ralph. And he said, Chuck would like to talk to you and bring your playbook. <laughs> I go, okay, fine. So I go see Chuck and he said, listen, um, we, uh, we, it, we, 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 we had to release you, you know, but I want you to go home. Uh, and do whatever is necessary to get yourself, you know, in better shape. Come back, and um, and we'll uh, in, in invite you next year. To come to training camp now, Rocky. Do you think that was a tough conversation for Chuck Knoll? He, I mean, he's a tough, grizzled guy, but obviously he um, knew your story. Was that was that tough for him to tell you that? You think? I think it's. I think it was tough for Chuck to tell that to any of his players, you know, I mean, to release, I mean, it's part of the job, obviously it is, you know, but you're talking to young kids who had dreams and, you know, are human beings specifically, and they all got emotions and uh, of why, you know, of why you are releasing them, you know, basically you're not good enough to make this team. That's what you're saying to those people that you release. Unlike today where you become a free agent or you move on or it could be, or possibly that did not exist. Um, at that time. So the fact that he said, I'm going to release you and we'd like you to come back the next year was at least a little sense of hope. But yeah, it's it was difficult and was difficult for Chuck. Um, I mean, he had this image 
uh, of, of, of having to make those decisions and somewhat um, not being a, you know, a, a warm kind of a person, but actually inside he did. And he loved his players and he understood that, but he still had to make those decisions. So anyway, I go home emotionally upset only because what's my future where I'm going to go, blah, blah, blah. That evening, I get a call, or it was the next morning, actually, I got a call from Dan Rooney. And Dan called, and he said, I'm sorry I wasn't there um, and uh, and missed you. I said, I talked to Chuck. We're going to put you on injured reserve and have our doctors take a look at you um, and do what's necessary to, you know, help help get you in, in, in better shape. And so, um, so I, so they did and they bought me a year and uh, I had a, another operation um, that's shrapnel that needed to be removed from my foot and some um, other ligaments that needed to be broken loose, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but they did that. So they bought me, they bought me that year and I, came back and went to meetings and hung around. And, and that allowed you, them keeping you on injured reserve, allowed you to get those surgeries. To, right. Because yeah. if, if they don't do that, are you able to get those surgeries or do you just well, have to yeah, move on? Or with whatever was, you know, it, they, it, they, I don't know what, you know, the, the thing is if they hadn't done that, I don't know whether I would have gone to another physician to say, hey, what, what needs to happen here or what, what's working out or why and uh and so but they did and um and so they so i came back the following year and um you know and, and i think about it this i think this i think about this in all honesty just in comparison because we had training camp training camp was like three weeks two and a half weeks training camp and then we had six exhibition games so think about that. You had like eight weeks of, you know, of decision making, doing good things, bad things, whatever it is, and give them a chance to see what you could do before they had a, you know, they had different cut down dates, but, um, but they, they, it gave you just that opportunity. And so I remember <laughs> like I came back the second year, I mean, the second year and I had, um, I pulled a hamstring in in training camp, you know. So that was like a week or ten days before that held up high, you know. So before I could come back and start practicing with them, and so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, I get a chance to play some of the exhibition games, like three games out of the exhibition games, and um, they put me on injured reserve. And bought me another year. And so at the end of that season, they activated me for two, three games, I think, um, just to be on the sideline. Somebody got hurt and, you know, whatever they needed a body. Uh, but that really kind of bought me, you know, so they bought me two years. And I think that part of this and part of this whole experience was they bought me two years. And I was in the presence of what they saw when they came back from Vietnam to what they saw by 1972 in 1973. So 70, I was on injured 71, I was in injured reserve 72. I came back and uh, I, I made the active squad. Okay, I made the active, playing special teams, you know, and um, and so uh, never carried the ball <laughs> during, that, during, during that season. But the interesting thing was in 72, um, I was the uh, leading ground gainer during the exhibition season. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and you're up to and, about, are you back up to around 200 pounds at this yeah, point? Yeah, 200 pounds. Because you, 200 pounds. you couldn't have done these things at 170, 175 no, no, pounds. No, so you had right. to get the weight you back. You had to get the weight back and get the strength back and get the flexibility back and get the conditioning back. So I'm the leading ground gainer. Okay, in 72, I'm mean, telling you, I've been leading ground gainer, good enough to make the team. Never carried the ball. Never carried the ball the remaining part of the 1972 season, which happened to be, as we well know, a very magical season to get us into the playoffs and the immaculate reception and, you know, all those. those. So I come back in 1973. Now, I'm going to tell you this. So I weigh 218 pounds. 
1973. I bench press 465 pounds. Mm. I squat 600 pounds. And I had 18 and a half inch biceps. And you know how I know that because I measured them myself. Anyway, so, uh, but I come back bigger, stronger. And, and the important thing is that what they saw was this progress over this period of time. Because seven, they kept you around. They, because they which kept me around. They didn't have to do. They could have sent nope. you home. They right. saw the progress come. keeping you there. Right. That's right. And so they saw the progress. And they said, you know, and part of it, they saw how hard I worked to be able to get there. And yeah. so they they kept so they kept me and they just and I and not because of talents or anything that I possess, but because they allowed me to be. Uh, I just worked hard and worked hard. And then not only did you get to have basically the greatest comeback maybe in American sports history, but the Pittsburgh Steelers got to enjoy that because they took the time to stay confident in you and you rewarded, you rewarded them. They rewarded you. And you both ended up seeing the fruits of the labor for the rest of the seventies. That's right. You know, and part of that, but I, th- you know, I think, and you're right. And we did. And, the, and all the, all those things, you know, come into, in, come into play. Um, but so, so we come back in 19, you know, 1973, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this in 1973 or after the 73 season, I, I, I basically was not going back in 1974. Um, I, you know, my mind, I, I, I quit the Steelers. And the only reason was that I just, you know, I mean, <laughs> you put this in perspective, you know, so it was freshman year and then, and then, you know, I'm in freshman, my rookie year in 68, then I'm in Vietnam, 70, I come back and I limp through the training camp and then 71 and then 72. Um, and then 73, um, I'm, uh, I, I, I make the team again in 1973. Um, and and I and, and I carried the ball once during that season, once during that season. <laughs> and I just thought, hey, you know, I did come back, I did make the team, I got a chance to play, I got five years credited towards my retirement, you know, so to speak. Maybe not to the level I thought I should come back, but hey, you know, I, I got a chance and that, and that was it. And I thought maybe my life's going in another direction. You know, those choices we make. And so my life's going in another direction. Um, and I decided not to go back to the Steelers. I kind of quit in my own mind. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because out of the blue during this period of time, and I'm going to give them all the credit in the world, Andy Russell, who was captain of the football team, I, I was living in Chicago, gave me a call. And there was a big sp- Sports dinner taking place in Chicago, sponsored by the NFL. Um, guys from all the league are coming. He said, so why don't you join us? I know I hadn't seen you since the end of the season. It'd be great to get together. Um, and I'm not going back. So I declined. He pushed. I declined. He pushed some more, and I declined some more. Then he asked me the question, why? And I simply blurted out, well, I quit. I, I, I'm not going back. And he said, you can't quit. He said, if you quit, what you have already done, think about that. What you've already done is you've already made a decision for that coaching staff. Do you like them well enough to make decisions for them? So no, your responsibility, if this is what you want to do, is that you come back and you make them make a decision. You back them in the corner. You give them every reason to either keep you or release you, but you don't cut yourself. I mean, the reality of this game is that we're all expendable. The reality of this game is we all can be cut at any time. If this is what you want, then you don't cut yourself. And, you know, it was one of those little arm twistings that you needed at a time. And, and I went back and everything that I had perceived, oh, did take place. And I had a fight with every free agent, draft choice and rookie, again, to be able to make the team. Leading ground gainer, once again, during the exhibition season. So I was a leading ground gainer in 72, 73, 74. And the reason I was the leading ground gainer wasn't because it was bigger, better, faster than all the other running backs. It was a simple fact. That I played more because they're trying to cut me. I carried the ball more, 
given those two simple statistics, I better be the leading dumb game <laughs> because all they were trying to do was give you a chance to be able to make this team. And they had to keep me. And so at the beginning of 1974, nobody knows this, I was the fifth running back out of four <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> of the season. <laughs> so Franco Harris and Preston Pearson were the starting running backs. Frenchy Fuqua was a backup. And I was the backup to the backup. Okay, so that was my position. First game, Franco Harris gets hurt. So Frenchy becomes the starting fullback, as he had been prior to Franco getting there. So he becomes the starting fullback. I become the backup to Frenchy, a place I had never been before. So um, he plays the first game, second game, third game. Fourth game, right before the half, Frenchie gets hurt. And I'm inserted in the game at fullback with Preston Pearson. Anyway, as a team, we win that game. So we get to start the following week, everybody. So as a team, we win that game. The week thereafter, it's a Monday night game, an extra day of healing. Franco now becomes healthy. Damn. But anyway, at least I had a chance to play, prove. And, uh, uh, and we had a pregame meal. And after we have a breakout group. Dick Holtz, our backfield coach, and he gives us assignments, adjustments, and he said, Franco, you and Rock will start tonight. I was confused. I don't know how I could. I don't know how we both could play the same position. That's what my confusion was. When it dawned on me, I wasn't going to play the fullback position as I had been playing. I was going to play the other running back position. I was going to play for Preston Pearson. Uh, and we get to start that game, and we win that game. We get to start the following week, and we win that game. We continue to go on in that backfield, and we win the division. We get to the playoffs, and we win the playoffs to go to the Super Bowl for the first time. We played six, four years. But the reason I got a chance to play, unbeknownst to me, was prior to that breakout group, Chuck Noll went to our backfield coach and said, listen, you have a weakness. You have a weakness in your backfield. Who's your best blocker? And he said, Blyer. He said, then start him. And basically, it boils down to one talent. And I tell people this, is, is that we all have a talent of one nature or another, you know. And so it, 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 I wasn't trying to compete with Franco. I wasn't trying to be, a, you know, an, an all-pro running back. I just wanted to play and be a part of an organization. And so um, because of that one talent, I wasn't afraid to block it. Uh, was taught very well at the University of Notre Dame to be able to do that. I fit into that backfield. And we play six more years and win those four Super Bowls, and I get to become part of a legacy of a team that uh, goes down in history as one of the all-time great comebacks. And in 1976, you rush for 1,000 yards, which <laughs> is uh, the four Super Bowls, incredible. You had incredible teammates around you, Hall of Famers on both sides of the ball. You rushed for a thousand yards in 1976. I, I don't. I, I can only imagine all, of all the accomplishments that you've had. I don't know how you rank them in your mind, but for someone who took shrapnel in Vietnam, for you to come back and rush for a thousand yards in a season in the NFL, <laughs> when but during the the heyday of the running days of the NFL, right, right. I, yes, it, right. It, it, for it to me, it seems like that that has to be one of the most amazing accomplishments. Well, it was. I mean, it was. It, it, it was an amazing comment. There's a reason why. I mean, now, for, you have to understand, just because of the fact that if for me to accomplish something of that nature, there has to be a reason. You know, just not because I have talent, which I don't have talent. Franco had talent because he gained a 1,000 yards, you know, through that period of time every year. He was our major running back. So for me to gain a 1,000 yards, there had to be a reason. And to this day, I th I thank Joe Turkey Jones, the defensive end for the Cleveland Browns, who in a game up in Cleveland, Powell drives Bradshaw into the turf as he sacks him, knocking him out of the game. It was the fourth game of the season uh, or fifth game of the season. Uh, and because of that, Mike Krushek, who was our backup quarterback, happened to be a rookie is inserted into the game. Well, now all of a sudden they got to just get, get, get slim this, this, this whole game plan down. And, I mean, and so, and, and, and that's what they do. 
just from a statistic in the last nine games and those remaining nine games of that season, uh, Mike Krushek threw the ball 17 times <laughs> in nine games. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. That's two a game. <laughs> you know, that's on average. And so, so what, what are you going to do with the rest of the game? Well, you run the ball. So that offensive line, you know, picked up, picked up uh, that slack. And uh, because of Joe Turkey Jones, I gain a thousand yards rushing. <laughs> Andy Andy Russell gets you to stick with football. Right. Joe Tur- Joe Turkey Jones gets you to a thousand yards. I, and the last thing I really want to ask you because I mean your story is so amazing. We could go <laughs> on four Super Bowls. How how proud of an accomplishment is that for you? Oh, I I, I it's not it, for me. It's ultimate. I mean, you go really. I mean, in all honesty, you got a chance of play in in four Super Bowls. You got a chance to to contribute in four Super Bowls. And you get recognized for your participation, which is terrific. But if you look at it, it's really, you know, yeah, and, and that's it. But it's you were talking about it before. Uh, all the Hall of Famers that we've had on 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 both sides of the ball on those teams, the characters we had. Um and uh, it and it really was that initiative that, you know, get us uh to get us to that spot. And to, you know, to be able to, you know, be, we were the first team to win three Super Bowls. We were the first team to win four Super Bowls uh, and just be a part of that legacy um, for your small contribution is, you know, something that, you know, I never thought would ever take place and would ever happen. Um, but be, but it was, you just think about the magic of that organization, ownership, from uh, and the coaching staff that we had, and we had some great coaching staff for Chuck Moulton and that leader. But then the draft uh, that we had, had and the characters that we had within that draft and, and those Hall of Famers that came out because of the commitment that they had made to themselves of what they wanted to be like, um, you know, was uh, you, you pinch yourself and you go, how fortunate and how lucky that, uh, you know, I think we have, I think, I think there's what, 23, 24 players that have all four Super Bowls. So you look at that core of people to be able to do it. 49ers, there's only five people that have four of their Super Bowls over that decade in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, so you, you say, yeah, that's how you got to be because of that core of people. Rocky, it's been 50 years since Vietnam. You've told your story, I'm sure, dozens, hundreds of times. Do you ever stop and think, just how incredible, almost unbelievable the whole thing. You lived it, so it's your life. And you, for all of us who hear it, you take shrapnel on your leg, you play in the NFL, you win four. It, it just sounds unbelievable. Do you do you ever think about just how incredible your own story is? <laughs> it's, yeah, whenever I get full of myself, you know, my, <laughs> wife, brings, my, my wife brings me back to earth. You know? <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> that's why. That's why they instituted the uh, the ceremony of marriage, so that we don't get too big. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, I, I I I think the realization is, you know, and, and you do, and I don't think, but how fortunate you are to be able to be in that team at the right time, you know. And it's all about you know timing and, and taking advantage of opportunities that that lie before you or whatever it is, and who knows what have what would have happened, but. Then and then you're just hang around and you hang around and and you're there and you get guys and you know then over a period of time you you go down in history because of what everybody accomplished and you're just you know you're part of it and I got a you know the story that 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 that, that goes with it but um but you know just what would the story be if we didn't win the four Super Bowls I mean in all honesty it'd be a nice story okay fine you didn't make it you came back or you tried that was you know, part of it, but then just to be able to be there. And so there's a certain responsibility, I think, you know, that goes along with that um, to be able to share it um, to give help, hope and, and help to other people out there or an inspiration of some sort that, Hey, this guy can do it. Chip, I can do it too. Um, kind of a, an attitude. So that's uh, that, maybe that's a role I, you know, I was destined to perform, but anyway, it's it's who I am. 
Rocky Black, tremendous story. I cannot thank you enough for for sharing your story with us here. It is amazing. One of the great stories in, in sports history. You've always been a great gentleman in, in sharing your time. And I, we, Rocky, really cannot thank you enough for taking the time with us here. Thank you, Corey. My pleasure. All right. All right. That's Rocky Blyer. Appreciate everyone tuning in on our Memory Lane podcast on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network.